Hello. I'd like to welcome you all here to the Charles Joseph Community Forum. My name is Gayla King. I'm the regional organizer with the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, a statewide organization that engages people of faith and people and families impacted by systems of immigration and incarceration. Thank you for joining us today to hear the story of Charles Joseph, a beloved Sacramento father, husband, son, and community leader. I'm blessed to have known Charles and his family for about a year, and I guarantee after today, you will feel blessed as well to be a part of his journey. So today, you'll be hearing from Charles and his ongoing and growing network of supporters and community leaders. You'll see a short, you'll see the premiere of a short film of Charles' journey so far, and you'll be invited to join us, to join the campaign to keep Charles home with his family, with his community, by helping us urge Governor Newsom to grant him a pardon. So a bit of housekeeping for our time together. We're gonna to keep the lines muted except for the speakers, but feel free to use the chat, lift up your blessings, your shout outs, show Charles that his community is with him and stands with him. You can also put questions in the chat and we'll have time at the end to address, um, to address those questions. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Charles Joseph to start us with a land acknowledgement. Hola to all. I'm Charles Robert Joseph, formerly incarcerated and recently released April 13, 2020 from Mesa Verde ICE Detention Center. I would like to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, big thanks to all who supported reunification of families and freeing my brothers and sisters from these walls, bars, and barbed wire fences and electrified cages. I want to thank the co-sponsors of this event, Interfaith Movement, for Human Integrity, Bulasan Center for Filipino Studies, Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry of California, Asian Prisoner Support Committee, Kahila Community Synagogue, San Francisco Public Defenders, Congregation Benai Israel, Sacramento, SAC Act, All of Us and None Sacramento, NorCal Resist, Quasi, Restore Justice, and UC Davis Asian American Studies Department. Let's take a moment to acknowledge that each of us individually is living on native indigenous land. I, re I recognize and respect the indigenous people as traditional stewards of the land. I acknowledge that the land was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous people. I express my gratitude and appreciation to those whose homelands we reside on. I acknowledge and pay my respect to the Miwok tribes, people, community, and their elders, both past and present, as well as the future generations. I was fortunate to be invited to participate in sacred ceremonies, and the sweat lodge is a big part of who I am today. I take this time to introduce Albert Titman, a community member and spiritual leader, and ask that he open this event with a blessing. Um, Mr. Albert. Kanya Asus Albert Timon, Tumale Nisan and Miwok, Maidu, and the Pit River Nation. Um, I just want to say a big come on where we lay, we lay Motakmo to my brother Charles <clears throat> for inviting me out um, to honor him in his journey of life. And uh, it, it just means from my heart to your heart, from my spirit to your spirit, from my center to your center. Hui lay, hui lay Motakmo. Because I empathize with you, my journey, our journey, parallels in many respects. And I just want to offer gratitude for acknowledging the land of my ancestors, land of uh, where we believe creation started, right here, right where the four rivers flow. And I'm here in Sacramento, California, and we're surrounded by rivers and village sites, 
now known as the Sacramento, uh, the American River, the McClumney River, the Colsumne River, and all the surrounding tributaries that flow. Our, our ancestors existed here all the way to the ocean for thousands and thousands of years. And, um, and we, 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 we call ourselves survivors. We're very resilient people. We withstood uh, centuries of genocidal attempts and uh, forced removals and forced relocations. And, and we're still here. And, uh, and it's definitely a, an honor to have you acknowledge us in that way, Joseph, which is really an old way. It's not a new way, it's a, an old way. And how we would always acknowledge one another as human beings first. Uh, whenever I would come to your land, it would be the same. We would acknowledge you on your land. And so um, it just warms my heart that you would um, allow us that opportunity to acknowledge you as well. And so um, we survived here. We gathered our food here. We hunted here. We fished here. We set up our villages here, all up and down the river system. Where, where the confluence of the American and the Sacramento rivers flow there existed, the Nisanen people, the Miwok people, the Maidu people. And on either side of the river, you had the, uh, the, Wintum, uh, the, the Wintum people, the Butwin people, you know, uh, and, and many other tribes as you move farther out uh, along the rivers. And so um, my grandmas and grandpas were Nisanen, Miwok, Maidu, and all the way up to the Pitt River Nation. And my mother was a descendant from what they call Mexico today, which if we know the history, um, there's a rich history with California and Mexico. <laughs> and so uh, without um, going further into a lengthy discussion, I want to offer a prayer. And I'm going to offer a prayer in the best way I know how in the Miwok language. And then I'm going to sing the song. The song comes from one of my grandfathers. And it's a song that acknowledges the land, it acknowledges the people of the land, and it acknowledges our existence today as human beings in this great time of healing that we're in as a people, as a nation. And some of the prophecy that has been told by elders many, many generations ago is that there will be this great time of the people coming together, all nations, all people, no matter where you come from on the earth, that there will be this great time of coming together. But it'll feel like the worst time ever in the history of human relations. It'll feel like uh, that we're falling apart, that we're, that we're disconnected. Uh, Hopi prophecy says that. Um, and I believe Lakota as well. It says that uh, generations old, that one day a giant spider would come and cover the earth in this huge spider web. And that huge spider web would once again, connect people like we've never been connected before. And we would bring all of our gifts and all of our medicines to share like we'd never shared them before. And we would, we would bring hope back to the people. We would bring healing back to the people. We would bring unity back to the people. And it would all be laid in a foundation of culture, spirituality, ceremony, and love. And that um, today, the elders believe that's, that's the internet. It's the World Wide Web, that spider web is the World Wide Web and what's going on in the world today, it feels like utter chaos in many senses. And, uh, but this internet, and this is a prime example, it's brought us all together, different faiths, different ethnicities, honoring the original people of the land and working towards one goal, and that's helping this brother find a path to uh, harmony and balance and uh, equity and freedom in his life. And so I want to just, I just wanted to say those words um, and for this song. I open no Oh, 
gratitude to the creator to mother earth to the ancestors of the land for all our relations today the relationships we have with water relationships we have with air relationships we have with plant relatives and animal relatives in our fire medicine without those things we don't exist creation doesn't happen so we acknowledge all our relatives that sacrifice their life so we can have life and I want to offer gratitude for our human relatives, especially the ones here today coming in support of our brother, that you touch their heart, you touch their mind, and you help us in this journey of healing, this journey of wellness, this journey of doing good things, being of service to other people. So we come in this, in this humble way, very grateful way. Oh, thank you, come on. We lay, we lay Thank you so much for that, Elder Albert. We are very grateful to have you welcome us into this space, into your land, and to begin our, our time together. So now we will transition to hear from a few other community leaders um, in preparation for the film. The first speaker that we're gonna be hearing from is Adnan Khan who is the executive director and co-founder of Restore Justice. Adnan, um, while incarcerated, serving a sentence of 25 years to life where he met Charles in incarceration, he inspired, launched, and worked on legislation with his organization, Restore Justice. When the bill passed and after serving 16 years, Adnan was the first person resentenced under this bill that he helped to create. So I welcome Adnan um, into this space. Thank you. Thank you everyone for having me. I'm honored and blessed to uh, share this space with you. I'm doing incarceration and all of them are very loving and uh, dear to my heart. So uh, just by starting off, I think I wanna share like, how we are, um, it is so easily to be caught up, quote unquote, systemically, and just bullet point, bullet pointing my, my life. Um, I went, I was, by the time I was 17 years old, I was a parentless, homeless high school dropout. And those are three things, um, being a high school dropout where uh, going through the school system wasn't beneficial for me or nor was it tailored towards my needs um, at the time. Um, being parentless and needing things from the community and society and uh, um, where funding was going wasn't provided for me. Um, and then being homeless, just not having a shelter and sleeping in cars, parks, friends' houses, couches, all during my teenage days uh, contributed to one night of me committing a crime. And this was at the age of 18. So when I committed my crime, I was subsequently sentenced to 25 years to life uh, in a state prison here in California. And about maybe about almost 10 years into my incarceration is when my uh, my points in California, I guess you could say, dropped and I went to a little bit lower level facility and that's where uh, Charles and I met. And one thing that um, we immediately bonded over, uh, we found each other, um, I guess you could say, giving each other strength in, in during suffering. And it was a time where we were suffering, not just through incarceration, um, but the feeling of being trapped and, and, you know, people say fight for yourself and not having a direction where um, to fight. So one thing we found was community amongst each other. And that gave us strength to at least provide some type of hope, love, comfort, care um, that was much desperately needed because our prison system is literally designed to take deprive you of love, comfort, care. Prisons aren't hospitals, and therefore they're not hospitable. So I was very blessed to meet um, Charles. I was bl very blessed to meet people like uh, Masango, aka Twin, and T, 
Um, and we also bonded over uh, the sweat lodge. The native brothers in that, in that facility uh, invited us to participate in the sweat lodge. And every week we would go in and we learn about um, just each other, the creator, um, strength and strength and suffering again. Um, another thing that we, we were doing um, out of nowhere, they opened the chow hall, which is where people go eat during non-eating times for a music program. Now, I am no musician by far at all, uh, but I know Charles is, and he had a guitar, and Twin and T, who are the other two gentlemen, they also had a guitar, and they started teaching some of the other people um, in the prison how to play a guitar, but really what they were teaching was not just the mechanical strumming of it, they were teaching the, the soul behind music and medicine, um, another form of strength, what we do have in our grasp is is maybe a guitar or singing or music or just being around it. Um, like I said, I'm not a musician and I appreciate Charles uh, being patient with me as I was strumming the guitar. And I remember a joke he used to say that you may or may not remember Charles. He used to say to me was, uh, hey man, I, I was like, hey man, I think the guitar is not tuned. He's like, nah, man, the guitar is fine, right? And, <laughs> and it was really me that was in tune, um, but just teaching me all these lessons. And like I said, providing strength and comfort and care for each other. After that, we split, um, and I'm gonna close off with, with this, is after that, we split. I went to a different facility, um, and I didn't know where Charles went, kind of kept in contact with each other through a third party, but, but that was kind of it. Um, and when I went to the other facility, that strength continued, I, I used to continue to like, that camaraderie, I missed it. It sounds weird, but I was in a facility where I wanted that camaraderie and I missed it. But I, what I was able to do is get that energy, that, that twin T, uh, Charles here, provided within my heart, I was able to uh, create that in another facility and foster that brotherhood um, elsewhere. And subsequently, what ended up happening was uh, with, with other community members, I co-founded an organization while incarcerated, still while serving life. Uh, from that, we created, initiated, and launched a bill called Senate Bill 1437 here in California. And about a year or two later, that two years later, that bill passed. And that's when my life sentence was vacated. And I've been out a year and a half. I've, I got out last year in January. So it's such a blessing. I mean, we haven't connected yet. Thank you. Um, we haven't connected yet, but it's a blessing to talk to Charles and Gula, or Gula on the phone um, and then see him on this, this Zoom call. Um, it's just a huge blessing. And one thing I do know about Charles is that um, he's been through enough that he didn't need to go through. And for, for, for this this society to try to deport him and send him elsewhere where we actually need him now, especially when there's a fork in the road in this country oh where the, an, an uprising is happening, meaning people are rising up. And who are the people who are rising up? The people who've been marginalized, discriminated against, people who have been stepped on, li literally put their knees, knees on people's necks, are rising up now. And it requires us to bring, um, I guess, community back. And I really think and know that, that Hula is uh, will contribute to peace in this country. So he should definitely stay and he has all my support. Uh, and thank you everyone for again, allowing me to share this space. Wonderful. Thank you so much Adnan and for sharing your story and your, your own journey of transformation. We now want to introduce another community leader, Nia Norn, who I'm sure many of you know as well. She is a community advocate for the Immigrant Rights Program at Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, where she works to advance and implement legislation and inform affected community members. She's also a leader and a volunteer with Survived and Punished Coalition and Asian Prisoner Support Committee. Nia is an extraordinary community leader, and we welcome her to share some reflections as well. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. So grateful to be here and honored to be part of Charles Joseph Community Forum. Uh, I, I think I would not be here if it not were for my community, uh, the support that I received. And with that, I wanted to go ahead and start uh, briefly sharing my story uh, before my incarceration and how I've been impact impacted by both systems, the prison and the um, ICE detention. So for my, myself being a child of refugee, a mother who um, from Cambodia fled during the war in genocide, and I was born in a Thailand refugee camp. And like many Southeast Asian refugee children, um, we came to the United States at a young age. 
and growing up um, in impoverished parts of the communities within California. And unfortunately, my, unfortunately some experienced uh, bullying in school and also um, got involved in, in violence. Um, not that they chose to do so, but growing up in gang infested areas um, where drugs were really available and being bullied. So they were forming um, unity and, and it, with that, um, for me, I was not involved in that, but uh, being involved in abusive relationship, which growing up was modeled to me, right? You no know, having role models. And unfortunately, I met a man twice my age, and that led to me, um, he being my co-defendant. I ended up being arrested for aiding and abetting um, the murder of my supervisor and my victim at that time. And as a DV survivor, um, as an immigrant, as a refugee, like many, that when we are in the, um, the legal system, many times the courts, uh, the judges, the DAs, they don't protect you. They don't look to see that you're a domestic violence survivor instead um, as a perpetrator. So therefore, I found myself at 20 years old, um, since it's a life without parole, um, after serving a little bit over 15 years, uh, I was afforded the opportunity to go, go to the parole board and earn my day, but unfortunately, um, I didn't realize I was facing deportation. So I, because of my conviction, even as a law for permanent resident, and I felt, how could the US do that to, to anybody that have already served their time, have no ties to any other country but the US where, the, where my family are from, and that many immigrants, people of color, uh, blacks, um, indigenous women, they're often criminalized um, because 94% have experienced violence, have experienced um, sexual abuse, have experienced other forms of trauma before uh, their commitment offense. And we're talking about these are the women that we're supposed to protect, but we don't, we lock them up, right? Uh, to silence them and then punish them further by trying to support them. And that was, me in my situation, um, I knew that I was going to fight all that I could to stop my deportation. And um, the Asian Law Caucus got the community involved in, um, in fighting for my release uh, to make sure that I would not be deported to Cambodia. So I was really grateful after six months of um, fighting my case in ICE detention in Yuba, after serving 15 and a half years that I was free, but yet I was not totally free. I was still facing a deportation, and the only thing that would stop it would be a, an ultimate gubernatorial pardon, a clemency, a pardon from Governor Newsom. And happy to share with you after uh, I've been free for about three years, I've received my pardon. However, I feel like my case is not exceptional. It's just like anybody else, any other refugee, any immigrant uh, that have served their time, why should they be punished further? Uh, Charles Joseph, um, Daddy, or PJ, uh, Key are all community members are leaders within uh, the community and they've um, worked leaders inside the prison as well. Um, they have transformed their lives. They have earned their you know, parole date. They have went through all this rehabilitative process, but yet uh, we're dealing with systems that again and again um, are targeting our, the most marginalized um, immigrant community members. And we see that over and over, right? But today, uh, alongside with um, the Asian Law Caucus and many organizations, um, the Vision Act Coalition, we've been working on stopping ICE transfers from local jails and state prisons. And we've been um, working with legislators, over 40 legislators have signed on to a letter urging Governor Newsom to stop ICE transfers. And yes, he has the power to do that, to make sure that CDCR doesn't work with, uh, work with ICE. Um, we still are trying the best that we can uh, to bring awareness to the plight of immigrants uh, with convictions, uh, because we know that 70% of ICE beds are filled with those that have served time in jail and state prisons. And it shouldn't be that way, especially when the pandemic is spreading um, within California and globally, um, and that people's lives are at risk. And why should um, people continue to suffer and die, especially if they're already served 15, 20 years, decades or to their time. And again, um, since Charles Joseph been out, he's already was organizing inside Mesa Verde, um, calling to action, uh, organizing for the freedom of others, not just for himself. 
right? And I've said he's been out, been very fortunate to work with Charles to lobby um, elected officials to speak on the on why ICE transfers must stop. And I'm just so in awe and inspired by um, Joseph's leadership. And we want him, I want him to remain here in the US to be with his family. This is where he belongs, you know. Charles Joseph is a great, you know, community member. And I can't speak highly enough that I've been very fortunate to even organize with Charles Joseph's family. They, um, his mom, his wife, his children were already working to fight for his freedom. And that is uh, beautiful in itself. And we want to continue to do this work to imagine together um, how can we give everyone an opportunity like me, um, like Charles Joseph, a chance of opportunity to win their freedom, to fight their cases from the outside and uh, to imagine again, a world um, free from cages, um, stop mass incarceration and um, being able to support one another in this fight together. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over since I know I don't have much time. Back to Gayla. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nia. Oh my gosh, you're such an incredible inspiration for all of us um, in the work that you do, not only for your own story, but your tireless fight for others. So thank you so much. Um, we have one other speaker before the film. Um, I want to introduce the center, the UC Davis Center, Abulasan Center for Philippine Studies um, out in UC Davis has been an incredible collaborator on this campaign with Charles. And we've gotten to know Dr. Robin Rodriguez as she has been very committed um, to not just the work of, of the pardon campaign and the ongoing fight for immigrants, um, her work extends globally. Um, she can't be here with us today, but we are blessed to have um, Dr. RJ Tagig, who is the Director of Research with the Bula Sun Center, who will share some words as well as share a statement from um, Dr. Rodriguez. So welcome, RJ. Thank you. Um, just a quick clarification, not a doctor yet, still working towards that. <laughs> but hopefully, you know, within the next couple of years. But thank you really for, for having me. Um, and I feel honored to be part of this. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about today uh, was an experience I had with, with um, uh, campus security um, back when I started grad school. I was riding my bike through the UC Davis campus uh, and a cop I don't know where he yells at me, says, sir, sir, stop. I freeze. Um, I am terrified, um, partially because I, I am undocumented. And, um, and especially given my status uh, here in the US, I, I always do my best to just stay away from police officers. Um, and so being stopped by a cop right then and there uh, made me frightened. Um, and it made me incredibly anxious. Um, and he pulls out this gift card and he says, thank you for wearing your helmet. Um, accept this, you know, it's a free gift card to the nearest campus coffee shop. Um, you can go on your way. Um, and this small but in even positive uh, interaction with law enforcement, um, you know, it really shocked me. Uh, and I, I was, I, I can't believe that, you know, the, the, it, such a minor event um, created such feelings of stress and fear uh, within me. Uh, and I was wondering where these feelings came from. Uh, but the simple truth is uh, I recognize that police officers officers in law enforcement uh, are not there for people like me. And in fact, they're not there for people like Charles. They're not there for people who are brown, uh, who, who, uh, who are black, who, um, who don't fit uh, this, what, it, what we idealize as an American citizen, right? Um, and this is the truth for millions of people in this country. Um, for all of us, uh, the threat of deportation hang over our heads. Um, most people don't recognize that for anyone who's not a US citizen, whether you know, they're legal permanent residents, refugees, people who hold visas, um, deportation is a very real possibility. Um, you have to be a US citizen for that to not be on the table as, a list, as one of the items that you can be punished with. Right. Um, and for some folks, uh, it's more than just a possibility. It's, it's a very real consequence of the U.S. criminal justice system. It's a system that disproportionately targets disadvantaged, mar marginalized groups, a system that is inescapable, particularly once you have been given a label. And those labels are usually under the lines of being a felon or a convict. Um, 
and and for this is for people who have been formerly incarcerated who have served their time. Um, and author uh, Michelle Alexander uh, talks about this as the concept of civic death. Um, this idea that even after you've served your time, even after you've you've you've, you've done everything that the system requires of you, these labels stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, uh, and you're unable to do things like get a job like everyone else. Um, you're unable to, in many places, vote or get a home loan or move to certain neighborhoods. Really, you're excluded from the rest of society. And for a lot of migrants, for many of migrants, um, these labels, receiving one of these labels is a one-way ticket to deportation. Uh, under the Obama administration and continued under Trump, um, the deportation has really emerged as the contemporary manifestation of how the American criminal justice system um, really uh, disposes of individuals who are unwanted, who, who, who have committed any infraction. Um, and this is a, a particularly cruel and unjust form of punishment because, you know, for, for someone like me, for example, I haven't been in the Philippines since we came here when I was seven years old. Um, and for Charles, uh, to my knowledge, you know, um, he came to the United States when he was a teenager um, to remove someone and bring them back uh, to their home country without those um, that knowledge and you know to just systematically kick them out is 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 terrifying for many 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 individuals and one of the things that complicates this is this idea that as Asians and Pacific Islanders we kind of have this mantle of of the model minority this this idea that we are the right type of immigrant and then there are ways um, in which we're supposed to act and integrate into American society but this puts incredible pressure on individuals who live in, within our communities and, and we have to cater to the demands of white supremacy um, and we do and when we fail to to live up to those demands um, and those expectations were discarded, really. Um, and there are 12.3 million Asian immigrants in the United States. More than 1.5 million of them are undocumented. And for all of us, whether you're visa holders, legal permanent residents, refugees, or, uh, or people who are undocumented, um, there is that very real threat that any infraction, no matter how big or small, can destroy the lives that we built and the promises of our futures. Um, and I, I do want to say that Charles Joseph is a victim of that system. This is, a, this is a system that is broken, a system that is corrupt, and a system that alienates and dehumanizes anyone who falls under its gaze under the promise of law and order. Um, I, I do want to take a moment uh, after, uh, so that was what I want, had, had planned. Um, and I do want to take a moment to deliver a little bit of a, a, an aside from Dr. Robin Rodriguez. Um, unfortunately, one of the reasons she couldn't be here today is her son had passed away. Um, and so, um, uh, I, I, she does thank everyone for the support and love during this difficult time, and she's overwhelmed by the fact that every like a lot of people have really pledged to carry on, on her son Amado's legacy. Uh, and as many of you know, um, you know, in his short 22 years uh, on this planet, he did he did a lot of things. He he was a loving and attentive son, a devoted friend, a committed advocate for all of those who are marginalized, um, from kids who get bullied to the playground to the multitudes of people displaced by gentrification, and to the black and brown youth who are murdered by the agents of white supremacy and to the indigenous communities whose ancestral lands are brutally taken away. Um, as much as Amato was truly unique, there are ways in which he was just like many of us. Um, he loved Marvel movies, he enjoyed hiking and camping, he was an avid video gamer, played soccer and practiced martial arts, and in high school he wasn't the class valedictorian, he wasn't the class president, he wasn't the prom king, but he was the kid that many teachers and uh, counselors paid little mind to. Um, he struggled with, uh, with mental health issues um, and sometimes felt left out and misunderstood as a bi uh, as biracial impaired teen. Um, but despite all of that, he made uh, hard and brave choices to stand up for himself and everyone else who needed standing up for. Um, and so Dr. Rodriguez invites you to learn about um, and get involved with the issues that Amato was, uh, was passionate about, and in particular, the passage of the Philippine Human Rights Act. Um, and if you want more information, uh, it's in that link at the very bottom. Um, and this is Dr. Rodriguez uh, and her, her younger son, Zizi, um, standing in front of a mural outside of Cafe Gabriela in Oakland. And if you have the moment to, to come and visit, or if you find yourself there, um, please please go take a look. Um, but in any case, I, I, I yield the rest of my time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, RJ, soon to be Dr. Tagik. Um, and just again, you know, just holding Robin and um, with the passing of Amato um, and wanting to carry on his spirit in all of our work. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. And we'll also share his story more broadly and the ways we can continue to, to support and lift, lift that up. Um, so now uh, we will move into the film. Um, this film was 
created by our um, Dream SF fellow, Javier Quintana Lopez, along with Charles. And we're just really excited to share it with you. So give me a second, I'm going to um, share my screen. Go. Charles was one of my sons that I really know that he was different, you know. Charles is always somebody that you could depend on when it came to anything. Charles, in the short time that he has been out of custody, this man is by far, you know, an extraordinary leader. Charles became a key spokesperson um, and a key organizer inside the Mesa Verde detention facility where he was being held. Bullet to all. Uh, my name is Charles Joseph, formerly incarcerated and recently released from ICE detention, but still facing deportation. Just one better for me. My dad is Indian. Because he's Indian, he couldn't own land on the island. He was part of parliament. He was part of the Labour Party, which fought for Indo-Fijian rights. So he faced a lot of hostilities. The discrimination that we faced in Fiji caused my parents to apply for, for residence in America. Even if going to school, he was doing so great, and uh, I kind of like have hope in him. Everything was good. I was a 4.0 GPA uh, student. I had my own band, you know, which my dad had donated instruments and uh, kept me centered. But then when he ends up getting locked up, it uh, kind of messes me up emotionally. Suddenly things change when uh, his dad was no longer part of his life, you know. I know he look up to him. Charles's life was really spiraling out of control. Um, his father had been deported, and he didn't have a safety net. He didn't have positive, influential figures around in his life. And he, he ended up making the biggest mistake of his life, and he robbed a 7-Eleven store. Um, no one was injured. He, he lost 13 years of his life for that. While Charles was in prison as a single mother, one of the hardest things was choosing between paying my bills or using that money to visit Charles. And sometimes we would go months without visiting him. When my dad was in prison, I was pretty sad and kind of depressed because I didn't have a father unlike everybody else. I felt sad and mad and ha and not and even, even worried about him too. Every, everything that makes, makes, you, makes you feel bad for your parents that is gone. One of the hardest thing was seeing Hope and Carly going to family events, seeing kids with their fathers, wondering when their dad will be home. I was fortunate, I was blessed um, to be able to be in a position to help my fellow brothers in prison. One of the things that uh, me and Charles was involved in was pretty much facilitating the cultural awareness group for Pacific Islanders and Asians. Charles was involved in teaching dances that he learned when he remembered when he was a kid. Those groups every week Every week was feeding us, feeding our soul basically, 
and filling up the void that we had. And we organized the event, you know, uh, with the help of uh, Captain Durnancourt in Solano State Prison for the, uh, the Northern California Special Olympics. It was a charity drive, a Flame of Hope. I was given uh, two certificates, one for highest donor, donor and the other one for uh, my work, participating and planning for the, for the event. And then I was playing guitar, making music. Charles was a great drummer. A lot of times uh, that music was our, our way of, of healing, our own way of therapy. And for us, music is a, is a personal thing, especially if it's your own, it's very personal. So we were vulnerable enough to share that with each other. Uh, I'll come out to the yard with a guitar and he'll come out with his guitar, we'll sit, we'll jam, and just created beautiful music and music of hope in the environment where there's not much of. Playing music is, um, is grounding, you know? It's almost meditational. It's like, I don't even think about what I'm playing. Sometimes I just grab an instrument and I just start playing. And it just takes you to this place of kind of where everything is clear. He developed from someone who was arrested and convicted of armed robbery with a gun at the age of 22 to someone at the age of 35 who was committed to violence prevention, who had understood and recognized the harm that he had caused in this world. Cause I just want better for me. On the day that he was going to be released, his family was there to receive him and to welcome him home. Because Charles was not a citizen and born in another country, his conviction um, subjected him to mandatory detention and mandatory deportation. So this meant that the, on the day that Charles was to be released, ICE was there to pick him up. I'm waiting, my mom, I talked to her the night before and she's like, I'm gonna be in the parking lot. So my mom and my wife were in the parking lot waiting for me. I was in the, in the holding tank with other, uh, other Hispanics around. There was a Mexican guy in there and he started saying, La Migra, La Migra. And everybody looking at each other like, like, oh shit, you know? And then he calls out my name, and then they look at me. They're like, what? A negro? <laughs> they never got a chance to see me. Oh. Looking at the mountains on my way to see you, not knowing it might be the last time I see you. When we arrived at your jail, we waited and waited for hours in the bipolar weather. And once we got into the building, we had to wait more. Then you finally came out of the door. I was happy to see you because we waited for hours and finally you came. We only got two hours with you, which went by faster than I thought it would. A few weeks later, I figured out that you might be deported. In my head, I was imagining Carly ending up like me, a girl that can't express her emotions and that is going through a lot, watching other girls with their dads and feeling sad, and soon all the sadness will evolve into anger that she'll have to hold in because she doesn't want to hurt anyone. He was my oldest son here, which I really rely on him a lot. After going to the vigil with Alumita, the girls and I, we had a chance to meet with elected representatives and attended World Without Walls to gain more support for Charles's pardon campaign. Now, to leave it all 
got to know Charles through his family, from through hearing stories, and Charles was calling. We were able to be in phone communication. This communication we had with Charles was critical, especially when the outbreak of COVID-19 started happening. And there was huge concern about the impact of COVID-19 inside immigration detention centers and California prisons. So he was a main conduit of information from the inside to the outside world about what was actually happening. Uh, capturing the concerns, documenting the, the actual conditions, documenting the lack of hygiene, the lack of protective equipment, um, the inability for them to social distance. We are father, son, brother, husband, and even grandfather of American citizens. We don't have to be in custody, fighting just to return to our family. This is not necessary. Faith community believes that the transfers that are happening between prisons and immigration detention are wrong. That people, once they have served their time, they've completed their sentences, they've earned release, should be able to go home, whether they're a citizen or a non-citizen. Being in detention, you're faced with the question, whether to stay and fight or sign and leave. But I had to keep in mind my children and how much I want to be a part of their life. And I said, you know, kind of in joke, joking, <laughs> I was like, why on earth would you want to stop, you know, yourself from going to Fiji? I mean, that's the most beautiful place on earth. <laughs> you know, laughed and he said, well, you know, I have family here. And my wife is here and my children are here. And I'm ready to fight as, as long as it takes. Right now, the law is the only way Charles can win his deportation case is if the governor grants a pardon to his crime uh, in 2007. Now, I cannot imagine a better case for a pardon than for Charles Joseph. I just want better for me. Some people open now that Charles is home, um, Hope and Carly got a chance to be with their dad. But we're still living in fear because he could be deported anytime. Well, I chose to fight and stay. That's why I remained in detention for 11 months. And I continue to fight for my children to be here, to be here for them. I said I'm ready now. Leave it all behind. Pain and hurt just ain't worth my time. And he was an integral part of my rehabilitation, basically. I just want better for the things we learned from each other uh, helped me and geared me to to better myself and come out here and do better. I said I'm ready it would be a big difference, like a very huge difference behind. for our communities. We don't have too many Charles Josephs. <laughs> we don't. Um, we don't have them in our community like that. The only way for Charles Joseph to not get deported is for him to get a pardon from the governor of California, Gavin Newsom. Be the governor Gavin Newsom granted me pardon. That would uh, give me legal status, allow me to go back to work. You know, provide for my family and remain here in America with my children. Charles did his time. Charles deserves to be home. Charles deserved to be pardoned by Governor Newsom. Without the greed, without the need to succeed. Stuck in a rat race, living in disgrace. Defiling their own space. Moving at a pace they can't chase. Grand illusions in their face. I said, I'm ready now to leave it all behind. Pain and hurt just ain't worth my time. 
Cause I just want better for me I said I'm ready now To leave it all behind Pain and hurt just ain't worth my time Cause I just want better for me Some people look on the horizon, look on your, open your eyes. Great. Wow. So now I would like to welcome um, into this space, Charles. I want to lift up Javier Quintana Lopez, who is our Dream SF fellow who made the film as well as welcome in Francisco. And just to share um, reactions and thoughts, one question I would like to invite them to begin um, is what is your hope with this film? Um, and maybe we can start with Javier, the filmmaker, and then move to Charles and then also hear from Francisco. Thank you, Gayla. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Javier Lopez Quintana, the director of the film. It's really great to be here. Thank you all for being here as well. Um, I think one of the main things that I want to get across with this film is just to show how how difficult it is to, for families to survive when people are incarcerated for so long, and even worse, when people are sent to detention centers afterwards. And I say this not only as an immigrant, but as somebody whose own father was deported under similar circumstances. And I think it's just, it's been an honor working with everybody at Interfaith. And it's been an honor working with Charles and providing him with the support and the attention that I, I wish we could give to everybody who's under the similar circumstances. And hopefully, my hope for this film is to not only get Charles pardoned, but to raise awareness of how terrible it is for people to be transferred from prisons to detention centers and to be in detention centers in general. So I want to thank everybody at Interfaith for pretty much uh, believing in my vision and also working with me to help me improve it and making it what it turned out to be. I think by the end of it, we created something incredibly beautiful collectively. And thank you, Charles, for, for making the music for the film. I don't think it would have been the same without it. Uh, so thank you all. Charles, you want to share your hope for the film? Um. <laughs> My hope for the film is uh, to give everybody a uh, bullet to all, bullet to all. That was, uh, thank you, Javier. That was amazing. Um, yeah, big thanks to Interfaith, you know. They've been a part of my journey from the beginning and uh, much respect, much love. And uh, I'm so blessed, you know, I'm so blessed. I have a movie after me. I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, it's pretty amazing. But uh, yeah, it's just, you know, give people a little insight on me, you know, it's not enough time. Uh, it's so much to pack in and that's kind of the difficulties we face making the, the movie. There's so much stuff to put in there. And, um, but just a little glimpse on who I am and I'm in your community. You know, I'm Charles Robert Joseph, I'm in Sacramento and uh, I'm looking to get parted by the governor, so. If you can assist me on my journey, much respect and I would, I would, I will take the help because I need it. But uh, yeah, short and brief. Wonderful. I want to welcome in Francisco as well. Are you here, Francisco? Is there anything you would like to to lift up? I would. Um, I, I got to thank Javier. That was just a beautiful film. It really captures Charles. Um, the music is so uplifting, and I'm waiting for that album, Charles. I'm waiting on it. So um, when we first met, um, Charles told me, so I'm, a, I'm an immigration lawyer. I manage the deportation defense program at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. Uh, we handle deportation cases for people that are detained but can't find a lawyer, and there is no right to appointed counsel in the immigration court and the immigration courts for Northern California and San Francisco. And we created the program in 2017 
supported by the city and county of San Francisco and uh, of course the late Jeff Adachi who would have uh, celebrated his 61st birthday uh, yesterday. Um, I, I talked to Charles you know, in May of 2019 when he was transferred to ICE and he told me to reach out to this country music singer uh, and she was in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Her name was L Lacey Dalton. And I was like, okay, yeah, um, what, <laughs> sure, do you have her number? No, okay, um, a Country Music Hall of Famer um, is gonna support Charles for his pardon. So I email her publicity, I get on her the web, find her page, write an email, and I get a response in five minutes. And uh, it is Lacey Dalton. Um, and she, Lacey Dalton, was his music instructor at High Desert Prison. And she told me that Charles was one of the most exceptional, if not the most exceptional musician she's come across. And she um, referred to lyrics that she remembered from years past when she was her teacher. And you, probably, you heard it in, in that song, I'm ready now to leave it all behind. Pain and hurt just ain't worth my time. And she talked about this lyric as a really powerful, extraordinary lyric. This, this man is an amazing songwriter. And I was just really blown away. But that's just one example of the so many moments um, that I've been blessed to experience since becoming Charles's lawyer. Um, Charles has a very challenging case. And uh, I, he has what is called by immigration laws an aggravated felony. That was from his uh, conviction in, in, at the age of 22 for robbery that I mentioned in the film. Um, and under the immigration laws, oftentimes lawful permanent resident, be mindful, he's a lawful permanent resident. He entered the country lawfully in 2000. He's been here for 20 years. Lawful permanent residents typically have the opportunity to ask a judge to forgive them for a crime. It's a relief called cancellation of removal. But in 1996, the laws changed. And um, a judge no longer has authority to grant cancellation or removal for someone with an aggravated felony. So the only argument we could make in immigration court was that he would suffer, he would be tortured um, if deported to Fiji. Now, there's actually a, a strong claim um, around that. Uh, but the judge in immigration court, because they're under these Trump rules to speed up proceedings and essentially take away due process, didn't let us call as a witness uh, Charles's brother, um, who was in Fiji, who is also Rastafarian and who has been tortured by the police. Um, this was relevant evidence. As a lawyer, that's what you do. You put on witnesses and take, um, you examine them and put on evidence and the judge didn't let us do that. So um, we actually, he was ordered deported by the judge. The Board of Immigration Appeals sustained his deportation in March of two, 2020. And we filed a uh, petition for review with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And we got a stay of removal. The federal government actually did not oppose a stay of removal. Um, so that case is pending. Um, at the same time, um, the, during the COVID pandemic, as you saw at the movie, um, Charles became a leader in the detention facility. Um, Charles also has underlying health issues, including asthma. And we were able to file a lawsuit together with the ACLU and other organizations um, and successfully uh, got his release uh, from custody. And um, that, that day was probably one of the most rewarding uh, days of my career, certainly as a lawyer. Um, I think this movie really does capture Charles and um, we want to lift up his voice, lift his spirit and ask you for help uh, because uh, getting a pardon from the governor is not an easy thing to do. Um, winning a pardon for Charles will not only mean great things for his family and him, but it will mean great things for us because Charles is a leader and Charles has already been able to accomplish so much as an organizer. Um, he's moved so many people in prison and helped people get in the right, the direction or the path that they were destined to be. And Charles also does that for me as a lawyer. He probably does that for many of you. Um, we need him to be here and um, any help that you can provide with the pardon would be great. Thank you.
Thank you, Francisco. So part of, um, part of our hope with this film is that it will help elevate Charles' story, particularly in the Sacramento area, that he is a resident of Sacramento, he has roots in Sacramento. Um, and so we've been working with a, a group of people representing different groups and organizations and faith communities in Sacramento. And I, um, I'm really excited for this, for the support he's getting so far, and hopefully that support will grow. So I wanna welcome our, our next and sort of last speaker who will give us a faith reflection, Rabbi Mona Elfie. Um, Rabbi Mona is the spiritual leader at Congregation B'nai Israel Sacramento. Um, Rabbi Elfie hopes to foster a caring community engaged both in the life of the synagogue and in broader society. So merging religion and social action has been at the center of Rabbi Elfie's career. And we're just really grateful and blessed that she can join us today with a faith reflection. So I'm actually the one who's grateful to be able to be here today, to be able to participate in this, this truly important work of, of helping a member of our larger Sacramento community. At the beginning of 2017, as our federal government began to very actively and cruelly target immigrants, the city of Sacramento declared itself a sanctuary city. At the same time, my synagogue, Congregation B'nai Israel, also voted to declare itself a sanctuary congregation, committing itself to housing an undocumented person or family who might be in need of shelter, as well as speaking out on behalf of those whose lives were suddenly upended and pushed into the shadows to live in fear of being separated from their families. As the oldest synagogue in Sacramento, founded in 1849, we are well aware that our city, our state, and our country were founded not only by those who were born here, but really by those who have come here, either by choice or by force, were documented or undocumented, determined to build a better life for themselves and their families. And in every single generation, we have been blessed and again and again by a new generation of immigrants who have become part of our community. As immigrants and the descendants of immigrants, and informed by our faith and our history, B'nai Israel has diligently worked for nearly a decade for immigration reform. And we feel that it's a moral imperative for us to take a stand with those who have come here eager to have a better life like Charles's family, just as each of our own families have done. And stories like Charles's is exactly why we felt that we could not stand idly by and do nothing or say nothing. We're also proud to be able to work with the larger faith community that has come together through the leadership of Sacramento Act, also known as Sacramento Area Congregations Together, and to work on behalf of our immigrant brothers and sisters as well as their families. Judaism, like every faith, believes in redemption. We believe that at the essence of being human is not only making mistakes, but also having the capacity to atone for them and to learn and to grow from them. Yes, Charles made a mistake in his youth, but he also spent his time in prison atoning for that mistake and very actively working to turn his life around. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 10 and 11, it's written that the people called out to God in misery and said, our transgressions and our sins are heavy upon us and we are wasting away because of them. How can we live? And God told the prophet Ezekiel to say to them, as surely as I live, declares the eternal God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn their way, from their ways and live. As a person of faith, I believe in redemption, and I believe that God wants for us redemption as well. I believe that people are capable of learning from their past and becoming better human beings because of the struggles they have gone through. And that's exactly what Charles has done. He's chosen a different way, a better path, and he has been on it ever since. If God has the capacity to forget, forgive, then so should we. Charles, as it has been said, is here as a legal, 
permanent resident of the United States. He's atoned for his wrongdoing. He's paid his debt to society and then some. And if he's deported, then we become the perpetrators of a moral crime by separating him from his family and punishing his mother, Alamita, and his wife, Shelley, and his two daughters. As the daughter of an immigrant myself, I shudder at the way that immigrants have been targeted and demonized by our federal government as though being an immigrant in and of itself is a crime. I was proud of our congregation and of our city and our state in taking a stand on the side of immigrants in these last few years. But words are meaningless if they are not backed up by action. And now, now more than ever is the time for action. And all of us have to raise our voices and call out to the governor and to really demand a pardon for Charles Joseph. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rabbi Elfie, for your leadership at Congregation B'nai Israel Sacramento and, um, and for the work that you've been doing in the, in the Sacramento region. So now with that, we want to invite you to join us, as Rabbi Alfie is saying, in order for Charles to stay in our community and to not be um, deported, we need the, the pardon from the governor. Um, so one of the ways that we are inviting you to join us um, is to share this film. So there's a few small edits that Javier is still making. And once that is done, we'll have a link available along with a toolkit for you to share in your congregations, in your communities, um, and as well as a way to act. So look out for that. That'll be coming after, after today. We also invite you to host Charles for, so that others can get to meet him and hear his music as well, hear his story as well as his music. Um, and if you're, you're already moved and ready, we invite letters of support to the governor, which we have also in the toolkit. So as we mentioned, Sacramento's support is really key in keeping Charles home. Um, and if you have relationships with elected leaders and community members in Sacramento, we welcome that connection as well. Charles, is there more you would like to say about how to join your campaign? I think you did a wonderful job, Gail. Um, but um, yeah, if you guys, uh, I need support, you know. Uh, if you can support me, that, uh, that'll keep me here. That'll keep me here with my kids, you know. And uh, after going through prison, that's the one thing that that stayed with me throughout, you know, is my responsibility, uh, understanding that I'm a father and uh, I was looking forward to coming home and uh, being here for my children, you know. Um, it's the first thing I looked for when I got out was being free, you know, after serving so much time in prison. But then I was faced with this, this thing in detention where I could be free anywhere, or I'd had to fight and remain incarcerated, you know, and fight to be here, to be here with my kids. And uh, that's the big reason why I'm fighting. Because uh, if I don't, then then I leave them here and I, I'll be free somewhere else, but they'll be here by, you know, without me, without my guidance. And I feel it's very necessary because that's the one thing I was lacking through my, uh, my teenage years, you know, was my father's presence. And so I don't want to do that for them. You know, I want to be present with them. I want to help them. I want to guide them through the journey to what they will face. I'm going to go outside. Pick up your uncle's daughter, please. Much respect and love to all. It's nasty. You know, uh, much respect and love to all. <laughs> Somebody's unmuted. <laughs> but, uh, Thank you guys and thank you for being here. Thank you for, for showing up. So, Char before Charles, um, I don't know if you're still up for a closing song. 
I don't know if you have that. Oh yeah. But we did want in this <laughs> thing that we talked about having um, important to Charles is we also kind of lift up a few other community members and campaigns that also need support. So I wanted to just invite Nia to, to share a few minutes about these other beloved community members um, that we want to lift up as well. Sure. Thanks, Kayla. Thanks, Charles. We're also working along with the community organizations, the Asian Law Caucus, to stop um, Patty Waller and Tins Farm. They're getting ready to parole tomorrow. Um, we're urging everyone to go to Bitly, stop ICE transfers. Um, it, it's the weekend already. We know that the governor's office is not open, but um, social media tweeting at the governor. Um, that he does have the power to stop Patty and Tim's transfer as back in July, he stopped Chantan Bun's transfer, he intervened. Um, so we're hoping for that um, as well and to completely, for the broader movement to stop ICE transfers in California, that CDCR does not have to work with ICE. And I also want to uplift uh, Leah Baru, who is a domestic violence uh, survivor, immigrant from Ethiopia, facing deportation because of protecting herself from her abusive ex-husband. Um, Leah, stories like many um, immigrant survivors, so you can also go to survivedandpunished.org to uplift other um, clemency petitions campaign. And you can follow us uh, to stop ICE transfers, follow Interfaith for Human Integrity, Asian Law Caucus, and the Asian Prayer Support Committee on, um, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. And yeah, just definitely stay connected with us and we'll definitely have a lot of next steps to share. Thank you. Thank you, Nia. So back to you, Charles, if your voice will allow us, allow you to, to um, to bless us. Definite, definite. Uh, um, I do this for, um, man, I do this for all those in the journey, you know, and uh, we all, we all part of a journey. We all headed somewhere. We all want something good. You know? So sing this song best way I know how. It's a prayer. You know? the song is a prayer. And it's, uh, it's in Fijian, so. Bear with me, I got a little scratchy voice, so maybe it'll give it a little raspiness it deserves. <clears throat> Here we go. Ongo na nongu, nongu masu. Kanyu sangadreva, meu sereta karao. Iti ova nivu ke amada bangare ni alongu amai tangiza ongo na nongu no gu nongu imasu kanyu sangandre dinasara meu sereta karawa. Naya da iti o iti o iti ni buke o ni buke amanda ngangandre ngangandre ni a longu amai tangi da ongo na longu longu masu. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We were going to stick around if there were any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat, but if folks wanted to turn on your videos and give Charles a, a, a smile, a wave. Thank you, Charles. That was beautiful. Thank you, Charles. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Charles.
Hey, can we go on to can we go on to gallery view and take a photo of today? Thank you, Charles. Really on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Her name is Marsha Hoffman. I don't know her. Wonderful. I want to thank all the speakers as well for sharing your stories. And we'll be sending out the link to the film and a tool. To his page with a rabbit. And hope that you all stay connected.